What's up, everybody? Look, you've probably heard of the peptide BPC-157, often referred to as Wolverine Serum. You know, Wolverine, the comic book uh, character whose body heals so fast, he's basically invulnerable. Anyway, this peptide speeds up healing, like all tissue healing, injuries, gut healing, uh, muscle recovery, Remarkable, it's a remarkable peptide. It's one of the most studied and one of the most well-known. And in today's episode, we have the world's foremost authority on peptides, Dr. Seed. This person is the one that basically wrote the book on this stuff. He is the authority. We wanted him on the show to talk about this peptide in particular. So that's what this episode's about. We know you're gonna enjoy it. By the way, we're gonna do a giveaway with this episode like we do with all of our other episodes. In this one, I'm gonna give away the super bundle. There's like five MAPS programs in that. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And then if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. One more thing, we have a sale going on right now. Uh, the starter bundle is 50% off and MAPS starter is 50% off. You can find both of those uh, by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. One more thing, if you wanna use peptides, if you wanna experiment with these or use these to speed up healing, to boost growth hormone, fat loss, muscle growth. Uh, don't go through the gray market crap that's online. Go through a doctor and a real legit licensed pharmacy. Go to mphormones.com, talk to a doctor there. If you get peptides, they work through a real pharmacy so you're not putting crap into your body. It's legit stuff. Again, it's mphormones.com. All right, here comes the show. Dr. Seeds, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, these are great. So I, we wanted to talk about BPC-157. I mentioned that to you. I said, hey, I want to do an episode on this peptide um, because it's just, it's probably one of the widest, most widely used, I would say, peptides, just mm -hmm. generally speaking. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you also wanted to talk about, if we were going to talk about BPC, GHRP peptides, growth hormone releasing peptides as well. What's the connection? Why why talk about growth hormone rele releasing peptides and BPC-157 in the same podcast? Well, so there, and more so, I think, following this, the concept of what you guys are behind, um, you know, BPC-157 is more of a recovery uh, repair type of peptide. It's a peptide focused on and I think it, it has that purpose and serves that purpose best in uh, recovering repair and in uh, for injury or for training. Um, and in, in combining, so what I was talking about were GHRHs and GHRP. So growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing peptides. So there's the GHRHs are like the CJCs, the tesmorelin, um, the GHRPs are like the ipamorelin, the GHRP26, um, the MK0677. So they're different. Okay. And, and I'll go through that again real quickly. But what, the, what I was trying to say is that that platform of those type of peptides together, I think you could, I could do fine if I could tell you, well, and it's actually, you know, where I started, you could change most everything as far as efficiency in the cell for most people with just those three peptides. You don't need to mess. You, if you just had those in your armamentarium and in, in your toolbox in combination with diet, exercise, sleep, all the things that are, you know, we find important, you're going to, you're going to just, you're going to change people's lives for the better. And you're going to improve site of protection of cells. and You're going to improve, efficiencies of a cell and BPC work in the CJC epirellins, uh, those things work well because BPC will increase growth hormone receptors on cells oh. and enhance what you're doing with the GHRHs and GHRPs because you're trying to, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to make the most out of, these signaling agents you can. And one of the, I think one of the, the significant, and, and the GHRHs, GHRPs, they enhance androgen receptors on cells. So they'll make 
your androgens work better. Well, let me, okay, hold on. So BPC upregulates growth hormone receptors. Correct. So for people listening, growth hormone attaches to a receptor. That's how it tells the body what to do. BPC in, increases the number of those receptors. So now whatever growth hormone you have becomes more effective in essence. Correct. And then the GHRs and GHRPs, these growth hormone releasing type peptides or compounds, they upregulate androgen receptors, which is what testosterone attaches to? Correct. Wow. It, it's like a, it, it's a- So there's a synergistic- Correct. Very synergistic effect. Yeah, I call it a platform. I'm like, okay, we're setting this platform for you to take advantage of all the things you're doing right or doing well. Um, and to make, you know, my, my belief in, in improvement in- uh, in training uh, of lifting or athleticism is always maybe not not the specific exercise at the time because all those things keep changing. It's actually the recovery and repair in between that m differentiates people that really can accelerate or and that want to continue um, or and makes the most out of how muscle breaks down and how it rebuilds. And those three peptides are focused exactly on that because the downstream receptor, so you, you're, okay, so you're using BPC that is improving some other growth receptors and, mm. and or, or other growth factors in the cell, in particular, increasing the, the growth hormone receptor. You're using these GHR agents, GHRPs to improve the physiologic release of growth hormone. Plus they have their own receptors they work on, which I can get into. But let's just say now you've got your receptors working better. You've got growth hormone that's that's getting to the cell better. Well, what's that doing? Well, that's creating the environment to improve the IGF-1 production, which is the downstream product of growth hormone, which is... IGF-1 is like the key to maturation, proliferation, differentiation of, of like myoblasts or, or muscle cells. You know, when you, when you work out and you break down a muscle, you have satellite cells that sit around this thing called the sarcolemma and these satellite cells by the action of trauma, they are activated and they actually release a... Um, they release their own IGF-1 EC, which is known as mechanical growth factor, MGF. People probably don't know that peptide, it's MGF. Um, that creates the ability to start changing that satellite cell, which is stem cell, into a myoblast. And then those myoblasts fuse to the muscle fibers to rebuild. Hypertrophy. Yes. I just read a study on that, by the way, where the speculation was on hyperplasia, but they saw a study and no. said, oh no, they're actually fusing. Yeah, we've known that forever. Everybody's, yeah. But that's awesome that you know, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what happens. And you're making muscle fibers like bigger yes. by fusing with other, yes. rather than creating more muscle fibers. Yes. Yeah. 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 I just read that study. It's pretty remarkable. So does that debunk our, our thought process around what happens to some of these like massive bodybuilders from Over dec time? decades? Over their, time, their muscle fibers just become, rather than creating more muscle fibers, which is what, what people thought, hyperplasia, you're just making them permanently bigger to some extent. Correct. And they're, they're just very, they're significantly hypertrophied. And, um, but you're adding, you can make, you, you <coughs> can, to some degree, you can make more, you can make some more myoblasts. Okay. You can, you can build some, um, but it's not, it's incremental and it, you know, those guys, those massive changes happen, just don't happen overnight. I mean, it takes right. them a little time. That's to years do that. and years. Yeah. yeah. Decades so, even. Yeah. yeah. So, so it happens, but it's all about, so what I was getting, what I, what I was trying to say is that it's that downstream IGF one, that's really the key from growth hormone, it's it's one of the key players in um, in uh, recovery and repair of of muscle. IGF one, it's insulin like growth factor, right? That's what it's correct. For. That's the when people talk about the muscle building effects or potential of growth hormone, right? When bodybuilders will take it, yes. Really, it's not the growth hormone; it's the IGF one exactly. that's causing all that. Because exactly. they'll take growth hormone, but that causes your liver to produce more IGF one. Well. It's in stages. So the growth hormone starts, 
it, it it starts this incredible cascade of other at of other biochemical pathways. So it, it's remember the thing I talked about AMPK. Yeah. So it starts that activation of AMPK that will start this process of influencing PGC one alpha that influences another factor that's a, uh, uh, that is a for mitochondrial biogenesis. It's for increasing mitochondria. It's for improving fat oxidation. It it like starts doing all these things that are what catabolic that start cleaning up a cell. But then it also goes down this pathway of producing IGF one. That's all about building and working with um, uh, building and with the activation of mTOR down the road. So there it's a it's a concert it's an orchestra that works together now is this why it, anecdotally right in the because bodybuilders have always been the i mean they're the experimental cosmonauts right they're the ones that go out and just do crazy stuff uh experiment on themselves and then you get a bunch of anecdote and sometimes they're wrong sometimes there's quite a bit of insight which is really interesting they'll always talk about how well, you know, growth hormone doesn't really, it, it builds muscle when your testosterone is really high. Otherwise it doesn't do a whole lot. Is it that synergistic effect where the IGF one is improving the potential for this proliferation, but you need the signaling from the testosterone to really make it happen? Or is it just so subtle that unless your testosterone is there, you're not going to see a huge effect. It's a, it's everything together. Okay. And, and, um, it, the, the, it, it really is, it, the IGF-1 is, it, none of this happens unless you're stressing the muscle. So you could take all the testosterone you yeah. want and all IGF-1 and not. There's no may, orders your, to build. Your organs might grow if you take too much. You'll get, you mm -hmm. know, those turtle stomachs and stuff that people don't know they get because they're taking too much IGF-1 by themselves. Yeah or growth hormone, they're, they're super physiologic doses. Um, but they, you have to have the stress mechanisms of the weight training to make those things work. Okay. Now, how significant is the rise in IGF-1 in a typical healthy individual who takes, let's say, ibutamorin or CJC or like, what is it, what does it look like when you're measuring it? And are there people who are non-responders? I've heard this where some people take these things and just nothing happens to their IGF-1 or is that a myth? So that's where people get caught up in the measuring. If you're measuring IGF-1, you're just going to lose on this because it's, it's a very quick response. It's a physiologic response, meaning you're not going to really, you're getting mm -hmm. enough, you're getting enough in the cell to do its work. Um, you're not, you're not necessarily making the liver pump out a ton of IGF one itself. Um, most of the things like the, all the ISO uh, IGF one divides into three isoforms, IGF one, a IGF one, uh, IGF one, e, a, IGF one, a IGF one, E B and IGF one EC. EC is the mechanic is like mechanical growth factor, but what those are, those are just all little isoforms that are active in growth and maturation, proliferation of cells that are local in a cell. They're local like in the, in the satellite cell and the muscle cells that are released that make things happen. So it's all at a local level. Um, so you're making the cell release this you're not it's not like you're sending a signal and the liver's making all this igf1 and it's going out throughout Got the it. body that occurs if you're going above physiologic levels um of growth hormone or you're you're using exogenous growth hormone or you you're using igf1 by itself as a peptide which you can use to enhance muscle growth and injury repair um that's a it's a great tool to use for that um then you're you you're going to raise levels, you know, serum levels of IGF one. So what I'm saying is physiologic releases of IGF one are just, they're there when you need it. And it's not like you're sustaining these high levels there. 
they're not going beyond a super physiologic level. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Are, are there any worries? So people get caught up in trying to, like I've had arguments. Compare it to taking growth hormone or something. Is what? Like like people get caught up because they compare it to like. Correct. Yeah. You're not going to, if you're taking growth hormone, you're going to increase, you know, you, you're going to increase your IGF-1 levels because you're constantly bleeding growth hormone there there's no growth hormones meant to be pulsed it's meant to be pulsed throughout the day biggest pulse at night it can be anywhere from three to six to eight pulses in some people but it's meant to be pulsed every three hours mm. when you take exogenous growth hormone that means it's stimulating 24 7 it's not pulsing it's you've all of a sudden got this growth hormone in that and that's what causes like negative feedback issues and all these causes cell senescence. It causes all of these problems that people have no idea that's happening when they're using it. But that release of, uh, of growth. So, so then you're not pulsing, you're just getting constant stimulation of that growth hormone receptor. That's making IGF one continuously. So you're going to get a rise in IGF one. That's going to be super physiologic that you're going to see in the serum in the blood. Got it. Are there any worries with grow, anything that, you know, growth hormone releasers or, or growth hormone releasing peptides um, in regards to insulin sensitivity or issues with blood sugar? Cause I know that growth hormone and insulin, I don't know. They're somewhat inversely related, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't want, if, if you're, People with um, disorders where they produce too much growth hormone tend to become diabetic. Correct. Um, if people with who have lots of insulin tend to have really low growth hormone. Yeah. Is there any worry that if I go on one of these and I take them that I could develop issues with insulin sensitivity? No. And, and in fact, um, the, the, best, the, the best studies have been in the um, specifically with AIDS patients that have significant lipodystrophy where they have incredible amount of fat around their organs. And Tessa Marilyn specifically is, is for them, right? Exactly. Okay. That's where all the research from Tessa Marilyn came <clears throat> from, uh, from AIDS. And, you know, what it, what, what you're doing with a growth hormone releasing hormone or a GHRH like Tessa Marilyn is your, you're really setting. So one of the pathways we didn't talk about is you're, you're setting the cell up to not utilize glucose, but to utilize fat as its primary substrate or it's for oxidation to make ATP basically right. to make energy. And so you're up, you're, you're getting that system back on track basically Again, these are you can always look at these as modulators because what they're doing is just letting the cell be, get back to where it was again, and that's what tesmorelin is help. It, it has it shows that you're utilizing fat as its oxidative um, substrate to make ATP. So in the beginning, like when people use tesmorelin, they may sometimes see their their glucose might be a little higher for a little bit or. They may have more, um, they're, they're just starting to use their fat. It, it's, it's like, it's a little counterintuitive, but you're, you want more fat to utilize fat, but in order to utilize more fat, you have to make more mitochondria. Well, oh, I see. Well, the, the GHRH is, remember what I told you, that pathway AMPK to PGC1 right. alpha to start this, the, the, the cell to transcribe more mitochondrial biogenesis to make more mitochondria. Well, that's what you're doing. You're making more mitochondria to use more fat. So you're catching up eventually to start. So initially you'll see higher glucose yes. a little bit because you're using more fat, but yes. then the mitochondria catch up. Yes. And then you're okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's an adaptation yes. process. Yes. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It happened. It can happen with people with just doing GHR, you know, like CJC and Ipamorel, and they can see things like that at the beginning. And that's why you don't get hooked into looking at those parameters. You, you've got to think about what are you doing down the road to improve insulin sensitivity? Because, because what you're doing, you know, like what does exercise do? So like diabetics that are insulin resistant, right? They can't get glucose into muscle. Muscle is right. your biggest endocrine gland. It needs glucose. Well, exercise turns off that mechanism and it it 
transports this GLUT4 transporter to the muscle that just brings glucose in with yeah. exercise. Well, the GLP-1 or the GHRHs, GHRPs, they activate something called AMPK and AMPK activates those GLUT4s to go to the cell to pull in glucose too. Got it. Mm. So it's it's like an exercise mimetic, but it's doing what exercise does, but it's doing the same thing. By the way, this is why oh. uh, strength training is the most effective form of exercise in terms of insulin sensitivity. Of course. Yep. You, just, you just have larger, you yeah. know, uh, basically storage capacity. Correct. And you increase all those GLUT4 Correct. receptors like crazy. Yeah, Correct. That's why we preach that um, yeah. all the time. Well, it's what it's, you know, it's great. It's funny you bring that up. I don't know why now, all of a sudden now strength training is becoming a real important in health. Well, have you heard of this podcast <laughs> called Mind Pump? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're trying to take the credit. We're trying that. real hard to promote it <laughs> that way. We're trying to We've take been the preaching for eight years about that. I think we're making yeah. some headway, maybe. Okay, then my hat's off to you guys. I mean, well, that, Sal wrote that book, what almost, has it been three years now? Yeah. Three years ago called The Resistance Training Revolution. And that was like, the well, idea behind it was that. It, well, this is awesome then. And I, I didn't mean any disrespect. <laughs> no, you no, didn't. No, you didn't. We're just fucking we're around. We're just super just, narcissistic. <laughs> so we think we caused it. But you can be. That's awesome because- because right, I mean, I mean, I'm. I don't care if you can go out and run a two fuck it, or two miles or five miles or okay, great. But can you show me how many? Can you get off the floor? You know, can you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about functionality and strength. strength. And yep. and I can tell you from a whole different perspective. You know, um. By the way, I'm also an orthopedic surgeon. I'm sports trained, joint trained, and I see all those people who say, "Hey, doc." where did my golden years go? I'm, I'm like, I saved up all this money. I've worked so hard for 30 years and I, I can't even walk can't with my do wife shit. down the street. I can't, I can't get off the, out of the chair. I can't. And I saw that when, as a younger physician day after day, and I was just like, what is wrong? It's, it's what you guys are professing. I mean, this is awesome. I, Billy, <laughs> you hear this? <laughs> there he is again. Well, it's the difference between catabolic exercise and anabolic exercise. And so strength training is pro tissue and that the tissue that we just saw, I mean, sarcopenia is, I mean, it's, it's everywhere now. It, yeah. Right. That's like the, it's well, <laughs> yeah, it's, if you don't have muscle mass, everything's going to go wrong. I mean, it's, you, you gotta, I can, I just, you gotta have muscle you know that's where all the science right now we're, we're I, 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 it's incredible where we are with looking at these things called myokines and exokines that are are actually produced by strength training by resistance training and in fact one of the bigger fields right now looking at this is cancer research yeah. because because there are these myokines that are being made that actually that act as um, uh, as inhibitors of certain processes that will propagate cancer or metastasis of cancer. Mm. And that's, that's a whole, that's incredible that you got to get to this point to convince people how important strength training is, you know, to, you got to get it to that state to, to show people like, Dr. Our, Dr. what was Steve, the study you I, just, I'm gonna, the I'm study you referenced that. just the other day about bodybuilders? Oh, mm -hmm. so pro bodybuilders. Okay. Not healthy <clears> athletes. <throat> like these are athletes that just pump themselves full of right. exogenous so, hormones and feed themselves ridiculous amounts and all kinds huge of stuff. Amount of calories. And so there was a study that was done on pro bodybuilders. We're not talking about people lift weights. There's a big difference between you work out weights and then you go and try to compete in bodybuilding. One's healthy, one is extreme and right. unhealthy. Right. And they looked at the causes of death and heart disease was higher in pro bodybuilders. Kidney disease was higher in pro bodybuilders. 15% lower chance of cancer. These are guys that are taking growth hormone, testosterone, anabolics, things that are at those levels are not good for you. And, and yet muscle so protective against cancer that their rate of cancer got, went down in these unhealthy individuals. That's just how powerful of an anti-cancer effect muscle has. Correct. It's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. So on the on the growth hormone peptides, I got to okay. ask you this because I've used them and they feel very different from one another. So I've used CJC, Tessamerolin, Ipamerolin, Ibutamorin. Boy, do they feel different. Ibutamorin in particular feels very different from the others. So 
uh, and I'm going to, this is just from what I understand. So I'm not by no means, a, a you know, an expert on this, but it's a ghrelin mimic. Ghrelin is a, a hormone that makes you hungry. Mm. So I definitely notice an appetite increase, mm-hmm. but my strength increases on ibutamorin, even right out the gates was uh, substantial in comparison Whereas the others felt much more subtle, mm-hmm. like what's going on, or am I just am I just not seeing the fact that maybe I'm eating more because of the, the the ghrelin you know effect? So twofold. Um, one, it is, it, it is a stronger. Um, it's not a. It's that's this is we're talking about MK zero six seven seven. Yes, it's, more. it's oral, and your were you taking which which dosage were you taking? Oh gosh. I don't know, 25 milligrams, does that sound right? Once a day or twice? Once a day. Okay. At night. Okay, that's pretty, yeah. So there's 12.5 twice a day or that you can do 25 twice a day or 25 in the morning or at night. I so, think that's what I did at night, yeah. So what you're doing is, with that is it's a mimetic, meaning it's not a, it's not quite a peptide, but it mimics the ghrelin-like peptide, which is the GHRP um, that- <coughs> increases your appetite let that some of them don't so you're 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 already turning on some aspects of mTOR it's more mTOR specific oh but you're interesting but what you're doing is you're actually mk0677 does have a higher increase in igf1 okay so it's just more anabolic correct okay. and it's more um because it, it has a better effect on pulling glucose into muscle. So it pulls water in with it too. Oh yeah. I felt that hundred percent. Mm. I got, my muscles got really full, like I was carb loaded or something in a very short, like within four or five days. Yeah. I, I think it's a great peptide and I think it's a great peptide to cycle. I don't think it's a great peptide to stay on for a long period of time because of some of the, some of this, this discussion I've had with you that we, that you brought up about, saturation of receptors Got it. and specifically in the brain um just the worry about this is one of them if so ghrh is you can never saturate a ghrh receptor but ghrps you can mm. and so that's where you got to be i just think you got to you got to know the that that's possible and and so you use it for three or four months and you go off of it that's what i've done i've done two to three at a time yeah Yeah. another reason why you should do this with a physician for that exact reason certain ones that can get saturated some of them that don't so oh if i did this like an idiot i would never stop right because i feel it and it feels so great Mm -hmm. i like the the sleep that i got on it was uh, that was one of the most profound things that i found from my butamorin was the sleep that i got so all of them will so that's so what you're doing is um your Increase so sleep is four stages. Your recovery and repair of muscle is the biggest part of that. With is stage four sleep and actually growth hormone. Your highest level of when you're younger of growth hormone release is that first cycle stage four sleep at night, and that's that's when you get better sleep. And so that's actually what it's doing. It's reinforcing that pulse of growth hormone at that time. And in fact, it has this incredible effect on, um, just like all the GHR, just GHRPs on improving glymphatic drainage. That's like the toxin release of the brain. It's, oh, wow. it's lymph, you have lymphatics in your brain and growth hormone is necessary to release the glymphatic to, to let the system drain and it does it in stage three, four sleep at night. Oh, interesting. It's another reason like brain recovery, basically. Oh yeah. It's why, it's why people, it's why as you get older, it's another function of why we believe inflammatory aspects mm-hmm. happen in the brain because the drainage isn't the way it's, it's supposed to be. Interesting. Hmm. So, so as you, as you start learning all of these things and you start th- seeing how much of a change they make, in mechanisms and pathways, you start like my mind started going, well, gosh, wish I would have started this when I was younger. Wish I would have been like at this age doing this because I might be at a better stage to protect myself later. Mm-hmm. You know, that's these, this cytoprotection is huge. I think yeah. for all of these peptides, just like talking about the GHRH or the GLP one receptors. Mm-hmm. 
Um, uh, same thing. I actually wanted to bring it back a bit to the to the BPC one five seven in the delivery of that in terms of like oral versus you know taking a, a, an injection and and sort of the localized effect of that the healing effect um, like what the difference is between um, you know both of those kind of strategies. So I'll tell you the first thing I'll tell you is I don't know if any of us really have the answer to what's better. Mm. But I will tell you, I was always the, I was always the one saying that it had to be injectable, and it was more site specific. And I think that's true. If you're working on injury, BPC one fifty seven works much better site specific. Um, doesn't like pull, have pull the bicep, boom, right in the bicep. Yeah, okay. or in the sub Q. It doesn't have to be in the tendon. It just can be sub Q. It can be proximal. Correct. Oh, okay. Um, and I that's just trial and error. And I'm just telling you, that's that's how it works. It's it's best if you're using it in that capacity for repair of an injury. Mm -hmm. And then once the injury is, let's say you've gotten over it, then you can use it, you know, around the hip area to be a general, to, to be systemic. That's for injury. For oral, I think it has a much bigger place for the gut microbiome yeah. and dysbiosis and things like that. Now, can yeah. it work? Does it work for people that have pain and issues like that, if you take it orally, yes, it does. So there is a systemic effect somewhat orally. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, but, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just saying in my, in the way I practice with using that peptide and and it was just trial and error was listening again to my patients and finding out that, boy, when you go site specific, big difference um, as far as just taking it, mm -hmm. gen, you know, around the hip area and then expect it, to do as good a job, um, you know, for let's say a lateral epicondylitis of the elbow or something. Um, and I inject in my hip, is that as good as injecting around the sub Q tissue, not going into the tendon because that you'll get into trouble, mm. but just getting in the sub Q or even going a little higher up in the arm, you know, around the triceps or something, just close to the area made a much bigger difference if you were in that area. Interesting. Is that, do you think that's because it's a, it's more effective at healing locally or because there's a localized anti-inflammatory effect that just kind of it just gets right yeah it's more localized okay. and it gets that signaling is much okay. stronger so i'm it just makes sense it's just there so i'm currently yeah. taking uh bpc with kpv orally okay and this is for gut health great now the bpc for gut health it's not correct me if i'm wrong um it's not antimicrobial what it does is in the gut is it is accelerating healing of, let's say, the mucosal lining or just gut inflammation. And then the KPV is more of the antimicrobial. Or are they both doing something similar? They're both doing something. So the the BPC-157 is is certainly working on, um, on the gut barrier. It's working on, on cell adhesion, improving the, the permeability between the cells. Oh, the junctions between, yeah. okay. It's working also on, on. Uh, it, it's working on giving that cell the ability then, because those cells you you, you mentioned antimicrobial. Well, your best your best mechanism to tr to offset bad bacteria or viruses or fungus or anything like that are you make your own antimicrobials. They're called catholicitins, and they're which are peptides and you're if you're making the cell barrier better if you're making the cell better you're improving the cell's ability to make those antimicrobials and to make and the and specifically those things called catholicitins and <clears throat> and there's also something called beta defensins which are other antimicrobials but the catholicitin i'm talking about there's one we know about called ll37 that sometimes we'll use it's a it's a peptide that we use to work against dysbiosis and so forth if we're with BPC and KPV and so forth. But so what I'm trying to say is BPC actually has, it has so many indirect effects on the, on the gut and, and improving the microbiome. And the KPV is a fragment of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. It's a three peptide sequence that comes, it's the anti-inflammatory pathway. 
okay. or anti-inflammatory component of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is a melacortin. Okay. So is it going to make me tan? No. Okay. <laughs> it should not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> which one those does are, that? Yeah. Those are melanocyte. Uh, that those those are like like uh, that's, mel mel that's melanotan two and melanotan one. Okay, those are like those are like those those affect the melanin right in your skin. They in, yeah they increase melanogenesis. Okay, okay. My, legs, that won't my legs could use that. Yeah, I'll be honest. Just start yeah, rubbing some KP all over your legs. Yeah, yeah. So th so this is that fragment that was pulled. Okay, and uh, and that has anti and has another way of working against inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and so forth, and they make. Again, hence they make this this um, environment better for your antimicrobials to work, your antivirals and your antifungal things. So is it fair to say then that BPC essentially improves your body's cells' ability to do what they normally do? So you've got wide ranging effects because of that property. It helps your cells just heal faster, not be damaged as much, and therefore. Do what they do better. Yeah, this is this is interesting. You say this, so I I had so I had a relationship um, with the Croatians that have the patent for BPC. They created BPC. <laughs> um, this incredible team, in particular, uh, uh, Doc, who who developed BPC and found it and and wrote all of those all those papers we read that are all the animal studies. Um, he wrote his team basically wrote everything on this. And I used to, he'd, I'd call him and talk to him about things that I was seeing and how I was using it. And, and, um, he'd send me videos and showing me different animal, like how he could activate a muscle when it was crushed and how just pouring BPC on the muscle would get it contracting again what? acutely. <laughs> oh, just amazing. Stuff. Oh, amazing. Like BPC is the real deal. And, and then I would start to talk to him and I'd say, hey, so, you know, we, we need to talk more. Let's talk about, let me tell you what I'm doing with these other peptides. And he'd, he'd just laugh and stop there and he'd be like, what are you, you know, what are you talking about, William? You, you, there's one peptide, BPC. Mm. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> That's all you need. Don't talk to me about these other peptides. <laughs> I'd be like, holy cripes. That's wow. funny. Because it helps with how profound, profound it is, I imagine. How profound it is. I, yeah, profound it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you He's look, like, why talk about anything else? This thing is so amazing. We're still learning so much about it, I imagine, right? That's his thought. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the, here is the, you know, it is the most widely used peptide that absolutely... Anybody who, who takes it can tell you it makes a difference. Yeah. Yet the, you know, we have what now one, one and a half, two clinical studies on this now, because it's not, you can't patent it. You know, there's nobody that's going to put the money into studying this. Like it really needs to be studied because it should, well, it's just starting to happen now. Now there are labs that are going after this now. Finally, finally, yeah. we're going to see some awesome, awesome stuff on BPC. Now, because oh, wow. BPC is uh, like pro healing, pro regenerative, yeah, does that make it pro proliferative for uh, cancer? Um, do you need to great, be careful? Great question, because people, you know, it it in it's a modulator, meaning. So this is what's the, this is the this, this is how I try to help people understand peptides. Peptides help the cell in a way that it can. It, you know, cell always wants to correct itself. It always wants to get on the right path. It wants to make the right decisions. The BBC, you can consider it as something that's modulating the cell in the correct pattern. Um, because they've, we have, we have studies that show that where you would think giving BPC in a cancerous state would create more angiogenesis, right. you know, more blood flow to a cancer, more, well, it actually does the opposite. Yeah, it does the opposite. Hmm. Um, and it has to do with these uh, VEGF receptors and, it, but it's, it's in the state of the disease. It's, uh, it's modulating. So then would it be safe to say that because they use, we've, we've got clinical, like there's, there's studies out there now showing BPC used, to help cancer patients that have been decimated by um, radiation and chemotherapy who wow. can't eat, who can't, well, you give them BPC and that you're healing their gut, right? Because you rip their gut apart and they gain weight, they get stronger, they get energy right away. And 
um, you're not seeing increased rates of cancer or you're not seeing any of those things you'd be concerned with. So then is it safe to say that it's, it's not making your recovery ability or healing ab ability above and beyond what your potential is? Correct. Okay. It, it speeds, it can speed things up. It just makes sure, it just makes sure you're on the right path okay. to, to that recovery and repair that, that, that the body typically goes through in an inflammatory response and a healing process. There's, there are all those steps that have to occur. So I remember as a kid in my teens and twenties, even early twenties, I'd get an injury and I would heal two or three times as fast as I do now. So essentially BPC is like, Hey, your potential still there. This is why you're going to heal faster with me. Not we're going to make you heal faster than you ever could before. We're going to force this thing to happen. Correct. Okay. Wow. And it's just letting you again, regain some of those efficiencies you had when you were younger, that you had the ability, you didn't have things interfering. You didn't have that inflammatory process or those senescent cells around that, that may not turn at the right time to help you heal or may work against healing. You know, cell senescence is a whole new world of understanding of how as we age, as we grow, we, we harbor more senescent cells. Do you, you guys know what mm -hmm. a, a senescent cell is a cell that is, so when a cell starts doing things wrong in the body, it sets off a program that basically says, okay, I either have to fix myself because cells have a cycle, 24 hour cycle. It says, I got to fix myself and get things right or else I've got to disintegrate, go through apoptosis, or I have to have the immune system come in and take me out because I'll do harm. Well, sometimes those cells say, you know, fuck that. I want to, I want to survive. I don't, I want to, I want to live forever. So they can stop their cell cycle and all of a sudden convert into a cell that is in a what? An mTOR state. Mm. And stays like that and almost becomes immortal. It's a zombie cell. Yeah, but it, and it creates, it just creates havoc. And it, it'll make other cells into senescent cells. And they build. And they can build in the kidney. They can build in the brain. They can build in muscle. They build around fat. And so they, it's just something over time that you keep accruing that you is they're difficult to get rid of. And... It's what happens as we age. And they, they're the ones that make these cytokines and chemokines and proteases that are pro-inflammatory that affect other cells that make things go wrong. So this is remarkable because um, th there's always this worry, like if, we, if you take something that speeds up cell regeneration or you take something that's going to cause your cells to, to multiply or grow or strengthen, there's the risk of, uh-oh, could we amplify cancer? Or could we cause cancer? But in the example of when you were younger, cancer rates and, you know, teenagers is like is almost zero, yet they're, they heal and recover at incredible rates. And as you get older, recovery goes down. That doesn't mean your cancer rate goes down, your cancer rate goes up. So this is literally a balancing, bringing you back to optimal, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And it's senescence is what leads to cancer. That's what we're, we're finding out. Senescence is the, is the root cause of us, of contributing to more cancerous cells or the, uh, the possibility of, um, of a conversion into an oncogenic cell. Are they cell. easily detectable? Is there a way to test and find so, out? Yeah. So it, we're not at, in a lab and taking a biopsy and things like, and, and <clears throat> looking for specific markers, we can do that. But Right now, are there tests that can do that? No, we're, yeah. we're not at that it's pretty stage. Pretty invasive to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's, um, you know, these are all. The, so the you're 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 seeing a big surge right now where you're going to hear more. Like nobody nobody talked about senescence ever before until we started talking about it a while back. About hey, this is what the focus mm. in cellular medicine. That was our focus. It's always been senescence. Now it's becoming this, just like peptides were nothing before, yeah. this next big word mm. is now senescence. Mm. And so now you're seeing these people say, oh, you got, you know, you got to get rid of those senescent cells. You got to take this senolytic to, to remove this cell. And got to be real careful with that because you don't, 
want to harm the good cells when you're trying to get rid of bad cells. Really hard to differentiate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of those things why, you know, what's your best, what's your best synolytic or synomodulator? Exercise, diet, those, those really, those set off the mechanisms to help the immune system to recognize these bad cells. It's, it all comes back to the immune system and metabolism. Mm -hmm. Um, Is is BPC the most, you're the one peptide you, you, you recommend or use the most with your patients? I probably use it pretty universal. Yeah. With most if, oh, wow. for about, um, that I, uh, most of the time. Yeah. I would say oh, just as big or maybe bigger is probably C max. Hmm. Okay. Oh, that's popular. One. Yeah, that's, 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 that's like the that's two bangers power. I'm on right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You you mentioned earlier that uh, you know with what you know now there might have been some things that you would have done at earlier ages with peptides to maybe is BP one fifty seven one of those that maybe you would have taken even when you were younger. Yes. But, okay. Yes. So what would that look like? Like if you're if you're back if you could go back in time. You you get to talk to twenty year old yourself. How would you cycle something like BP? Would you just put take it indefinitely? Or would you cycle it every six months? Like how would you do it? You know, that's a I I don't have an answer for that specifically. I and I'm not pushing that really, but I'm thinking about it. Like I'm I just think in my own brain. Like if right. it was me, this right. is what I would yeah, be doing. This is you. We're not prescribing to okay. anybody else. All this right. is you. What would you go do? Oh, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, I would be be in my drinking water. I'd be. It would be, I I would be doing it more for my microbiome and my gut, I think Mm -hmm. than anything else. And I would be taking it orally in lower doses, like 250 micrograms, um, daily. And I think it would be an incredible benefit for me. Are you, Mm. as an orthopedic surgeon, have you like, cause obviously you have experience, you're working on people's joints, you know, how fast generally it takes something to heal. You know what? bad joints look like, you know, what it look, they look like when they're good. When you're using BPC or your patients are using BPC, your orthopedic patients, is it like night and day? Are you looking at them going, wow, this is like, when you first started using this, were you like, this is wild? Yeah. I mean, it, that it even started with just using, I mean, if I could take a step back when I started just using oral collagen, like collagen hydrosylate. Mm. And getting my patients ready for surgery, I was thinking I was, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get you ready for surgery. You know, I have 30% of those people coming back saying I don't need surgery. Oh, so you well, killed your business. Yeah, like well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, but it was, it was pretty incredible, yeah. right? It's yeah. where I start. This was 20 some years ago before they even wrote the paper on yeah. collagen. Like I was doing bone marrow stuff. I was, I just knew that it was something that could enhance healing because of what it does in the immune system, all these things sure. people don't know about, but that we teach. And I was seeing this happening in front of me and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is this is so simple. And then Great Lakes had their uh, collagen hydrosylate that came out of the kosher product yeah, and yeah, tub, yeah. amazing product for pennies on the dollar. And I just started putting, I just, everybody, all my people just had to go on it. And I'd get people like, doc, I'm feeling a lot better, especially like for- more for people that I thought needed a knee arthroscopy, mm-hmm. you know, that had some some degenerative cartilage changes, maybe like chondromalacia, yeah, okay. you know, or meniscal tear or something that wasn't quite mechanical, but they were having problems, and and you put them on the collagen, and they're like, oh my god, it it changed, and it just that, and so that's where that was what got me really going more towards, okay, you know, all these biologics, you know, all these things that you're, you've been studying for 40 years, let's start implementing more. And so that, you know, the BPC made a tremendous difference. Um, But then at the time, um, you know, it was tough because of who could afford to use it and, and how to use that, you know, cause it, none of that is covered by insurance. So that was always a difficult conversation, yeah. but, yeah, but the price has come down quite a bit for BPC. Oh, it's from, it's come down tremendously from when it was very difficult, very, mm-hmm. very difficult to get. Wow. Any areas of the body you see its effects be most pronounced or is it just generally great? Uh, well, or types of injuries you see it be most effective for? 
Yeah, I, I want to say it just more like acute type of things. It, it You can really see changes quicker. Chronic type of injuries, that's a little different ballgame. That's where you got to use other combinations. Because mm, yeah. um, you also might not be addressing the root. Like maybe it's a movement pattern or something. That's Yeah, there's just a lot of other aspects of chronic injury that you got to address. And there's more of the immune side that's come into this picture with a, with chronic injury, mm-hmm. immune cells play a big role. So BPC doesn't have quite the effect on the immune part of metabolism, like things like thymus and beta four or um, thymus and alpha one or thymulin or epitalon or things that have a, an impact on the immune system where you've got to address that first or you're never going to get through that chronic problem. Got it. So, so chronic issues, then you'll combine them type of deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've, I, you know, I'm using it now. Adam had a quad injury that keeps reoccurring. Mm. He used it on his quad and he used it first on my Achilles. It was, it worked so well. It was scary. It worked like I, when I did my Achilles, I was so nervous to sprint, run, do anything. (laughs) I could feel felt off. Didn't feel right. Even after it healed. And so uh, I finally got the BPC one. This was a couple of years ago. And I mean, it was only a few shots into using it. And it felt like there wasn't an injury anywhere, which scared me. I was just like, it can't be that good already. Like, so. But it does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's scary how effective it is. Yeah, I I think that's where it's made its mark is, is in the acute side of being able to see what it can really do. And, um, and that's the, that's the other great thing about it. You know, you don't have to. You, you can cycle for a couple of weeks, two, three, six weeks on it, depending on the injury, and then you can be done with it. I mean, you don't, these, you don't have to keep taking it. Um, my mindset is, again, more in the protective side and the recovery repair side because I want all those things working for me 24-7. Right? Are you seeing any benefits on um, uh, organs? Like if you take it orally, do you see any, like let's say with someone who has some, maybe some liver damage or cirrhosis, or we notice anything? No, I don't think you can make those statements okay. that it improves fatty liver disease or there, there are different peptides for that. Got it. Got it. Well, this has been awesome again, Dr. Seeds. Yeah. This, this is uh, every time I talk to you, yeah. I get my mind blown with this information. <laughs> Billy, mm-hmm. we'll just keep you. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> for anybody to know, my son's back here. Mm-hmm. This is like, re- re- what do you call it? Uh, you're, you're building me up and yeah. he's going to get in the car and go, dad, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> they're full of shit. Dad. Yeah, yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah. Pumping your tires. They don't change, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't That's change so much for. later. I think, so. uh, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't even work. Like, uh, you know, when you get a great lift in and you got him spotting and you go, what'd you think? He's like, yeah, it wasn't bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, it's, it's impossible to be a prophet in your own town, man. Yeah. Sal knows what's up. He's got a teenager. So oh, yeah. yeah, I want to be a teenager. Teen, so. <laughs> hey, what, are, what are your, what, how, how is your workout? If you don't mind me asking, what kind of training do you do? I'm curious. Uh, it depends what my kids tell me they're doing because I got to keep up with them. But I, I try to do, I'm big in strength and just pure strength, um, trying to keep some of those. I'm, I'm getting more and more into more body weight, uh, high repetition. So I really mix it up. You know, I, I do low intensity and high intensity because you got to, you got to have both. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys know, I mean, you, you've got to keep changing it, right? I'm, oh. I'm all over the gambit, but I'm, um, I, be, I believe in all the big lifts, the, you know, the squat, the bench and the um, deadlift. And uh, probably as you get into my realm, I mean, the probably the bigger, bigger exercise for me is the posterior chain and the reverse hyper and, oh, yeah. and keeping that function, which I can tell you for me, if I'm not on it, I, I can, that's a tough one. You know, you, mm-hmm. you brought up something. We we talked about this, like, I don't know, maybe a year ago. We're talking about, uh, I can make the case that I think the deadlift is the king of all exercises. Everyone says the squat is the king of all exercises. And my, my argument for it was exactly that, how much we neglect the posterior chain. And then, of course, as we age and just everything is rounding and closing in. So strengthening the opposing side just logically to me seems like, the extra benefit. And then you get all similar benefits of all the muscles you're activating, like in a squat, you get most of those in a deadlift too. So I made the case that deadlifting is the king of all exercises for that, for that purpose. Yeah, no, it is. If it, but the, what's the hardest thing with that? It's doing it correctly, right. not overdoing it. Right. Especially as you get older. Cause I get, you know, that, that, that's the, probably the, my, my biggest, uh, 
probably the best thing I have going for me is my knowledge because it, I get hurt all the time yeah. and I, I have to, I have to readjust, right? Yeah. I have to, okay, I've strained a pack. I got to go from flat bench to incline now for the next six months. And, yeah. and then you get into that incline, you're like, why am I going to go back to flat bench if yeah. I hurt myself? It's <laughs> like, you, I start thinking more about how I can't hurt myself. Yep. And then I find a way to hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ego, ego's the enemy with it. It's, 100%. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's crazy. But uh, I will tell you though, my son, my kids have gotten more into more functional type of training. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pull-ups, the compet, the the hundreds of thousands of body squats, or you know things that you just do over and over. And I've been doing incorporating that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, that's the the beautiful yeah, relationship. Contrast. Is, but the two of those, the two of those together, if you can the mix a good yeah. body right. weight mobility right. routine right. with a heavy <laughs> strength training routine. You know, the problem with all of us is that we all, we, with all that knowledge and being science and fitness nerds is we also like to, to, to find the boundary, the yeah, line, right? I know that line. <laughs> I do a little exists. more. Let's see. So I, I think that's a forever yeah. battle. That I'll be trying to hit PRs <laughs> until I die. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent, but that's what makes it fun. And right. that's what makes it, you, and it makes it, you know, this is what I keep saying. I, I don't know if this helps you with you, what you guys are doing, but I really think that my, I, I have tremendous kids. I got incredible three boys that have grown up and, you know, I, I couldn't say anything more about how amazing they all are, but I really believe their discipline and all the things that the way they focus their lives, I think it really started by working out and being disciplined and training and slowly, not quickly, but slowly seeing how things change and staying in that mode because my our at our house our living room was is the garage like when they needed to find me they came out or they came out and they worked out with me and it's i really believe that and i i hope that helps with people understanding that this stuff doesn't happen overnight it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's a it's a lifestyle you, right? are, yeah. you are preaching no, the choir absolutely beautiful, yeah absolutely i was I, actually what i was um oh i'm talking too much but i was just talking to billy my son the other day I saw this picture of this guy who was lifting. Uh, he was doing. He was on an inclined bench, and next to him was his little kid with a plas with a yeah, play set. That's yeah. right. mm -hmm. And I said, "Billy, do you remember that? Because my kids, I always had play sets for them to come out and bench." And he's like, "Yep, I remember." That's so awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's, That's so awesome. awesome. Well, thanks for coming on again, Doctor Seeds. Yep, this is great. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, guys. And Thank great you. message you're putting out there. I I love it. Appreciate it.